Have you ever been to a black tie event and then got dirty stares because you were underdressed or overdressed? Yeah, no, me either. I've never been to a black tie event. In today's day and age, you'd get a few dirty stares and it might be a little uncomfortable. But 400 years ago, you could be fined, you could end up in prison, or you could even suffer corporal punishment for wearing what you were not entitled to wear. This was because of something called sumptuary laws, which I think is a massively undervalued and underutilized fantasy world building tools. And that is the topic of my discussion today. What are sumptuary laws and how can you use them to build a rich and engaging culture in your fantasy world? Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you'd like to support me in making more of these videos, you can hit my Ko-fi page down below where I have both memberships and one-off donations, or you can buy my books available on Amazon.com. Okay, let's get cracking. So first, what are sumptuary laws? Sumptuary laws governed what you could wear, what you could eat, and the furniture you could buy. But really, the focus of sumptuary laws was around what you could wear, both in terms of cut, color, and the texture of the cloth, and the type of you know, fabric and textile. The reasoning behind sumptuary laws was predominantly to enforce the hierarchy. If you check the whiteboard, you can see that the actual law text is there for England's sumptuary law. And you can see that it focused on reinforcing hierarchy based on birthright. The same applied in Sweden, where they identified four estates for their sumptuary laws. The clergy, the nobility, the burghers, and the farmers. On a side note, why do you think farmers always get the short end of the stick? How come it's always farmers are the worst people? Like, farmers are the most hardworking people I know, and farming is backbreaking labor. If you know a farmer, be nice to a farmer. Their job really is like gambling, and it is backbreaking labor. Okay, enough of that. Back to sumptuary laws. France, of course, had a plethora of sumptuary laws, mostly targeted at the aristocracy. And it wasn't just Europe that had sumptuary laws. China and Japan both had extensive laws governing what you could and could not wear. In China, it was all around a kind of neo-Confucius culture that arose after the Mongol invasion that the Ming emperors brought in that governed very strictly, even down to like bureaucratic levels, what kind of hat a bureaucrat could wear, what kind of colors they could wear, the linings on the inside of their shirts. Of course, people being people, most people just ignored those rules, despite the severe penalties that were never really applied. So, you know, people are people. You make those kind of rules, what you're really doing is you're making it desirable to dress that way. In fantasy, the few examples where sumptuary type laws apply, it is often around this hierarchy that the enforcement comes. I use it in my world. I have my noble sash item that identifies my nobility. And it's got specific colors associated with whether you're a baron, a count, a duke. And, addi and additionally, it's got specific heraldic devices associated with your rank within the tier of nobility. So a chevalier, a ducal, um, a marquis, an earl, they've all got different kinds of these rank insignia and of course your family crest is on it as well so if you look at a person wearing a noble sash you can read a lot about them and if you wear a sash you're not entitled to that's 20 lashes in the town square for the person wearing it and 20 lashes for the tailor that made the fake sash if they can find him if you wear a ducal sash a purpure sash and you're not entitled to one, that's a hanging offense. So I've implemented that kind of very rank-based hierarchy around my sashes. The other place where I've seen kind of sumptuary laws implemented is in Jacqueline Carey's Cashil series. And that is like and that is associated with the color Sanguera, which is a red, which is the color of blood under moonlight. 
it's just a beautiful description. The color of blood under moonlight. And only anguzettes are allowed to wear that. Only those touched by Kashil's dart are allowed to wear that. But if I'm going to discuss sumptuary laws in fantasies, I have to, of course, discuss The Handmaid's Tale. Now, The Handmaid's Tale has been brought to television in superb manner by HBO. And you can see so clearly the application of sumptuary laws to enforce the hierarchy. Handmaids wear red, wives wear blue, aunts wear brown, and they have specific cuts and styles of uniforms. The white hoods, the wives being able to wear just kind of the scarves, the aunts in their brown militaristic uniform. You can absolutely see the hierarchy being reinforced by the clothing type. Hierarchy, however, wasn't the only reason for sumptuary laws. Let's turn our attention to the Italian city-states because their sumptuary laws were spectacular. Up to 40% of a patrician's income in an Italian city-state could be spent on clothing. It could be spent on flexing his wealth to his neighbors. They actually implemented sumptuary laws to give themselves a reason to tell their wives, no, honey, we can't spend that much on a wedding. It's against the law. The sumptuary laws in Florence were called Ufficiale Donna Dalla, which translates into officials of women. And bearing in mind that these patricians were also the legislatures of Florence, so they were creating these laws to prevent that kind of expenditure from getting completely out of hand. Also, it did reinforce the hierarchy. I mean, of course it did. So the kind of sumptuary laws that were implemented in Italy were things like in Padova, they limited a woman to two silk dresses. In Bologna, they fined those who wore gilded silver fasteners. In Venice, they forbade trains and French fashion, so they actually protected their own tailor industry a little bit. And in Florence, they specified that corpses could only be buried in plain wool, possibly lined with linen. The grave was apparently no place for finery. So that is what some tree laws were and what some of their primary goals were. If you enjoyed this discussion, hit the thumbs up button and let's talk about sumptuary laws and their effect on economics. So those Italian city-states, they had fines that they implemented for their transgressors against the sumptuary law code. In due time, those fines actually became licenses. So if you wanted to wear the finery, you basically paid X amount a year, and then you were allowed to wear these things that were against the sumptuary laws. Now, this had the net effect of bringing a lot of money in to the government. So it actually filled the government coffers. What's more, it also allowed people to flex again with their wealth because now they're wearing a thing that is licensed. So it proves that they're all kinds of rich. And just to illustrate like how much money was brought in, under the 1373 rules, 50 gold florins, which was enough to pay a crossbow man for 15 months, gave a woman the right to wear a woolen dress embellished with silk patterns. For 25 florins, a married woman could decorate her hemlines. Otherwise, only unmarried women could decorate their hemlines. For 10 florins, a man could wear panons curtos, short clothes, revealing his legs above the middle of his thighs, because apparently it's just too sexy to see a man's legs, you understand. All the women would just swoon. And for the same amount of money, a woman could have silk-covered buttons. So 10 florins a year, and you could wear silk-covered buttons. It's amazing. Seriously, more people need to use this stuff in their world. But regardless, you can see that they actually gathered quite a lot of money using these fine systems. 
Indeed, this was often used by the government when they really needed money because it is a wealth tax, right? It's a luxury item tax. So only those who can really afford it need to pay it. So you fill your coffers without creating a grumbling amongst the commoners and peasants who already have probably a poll tax burden. So bear that in mind if you have a government that suddenly finds itself in need of money and think about some sumptuary laws. But direct fines is not the only effect that sumptuary laws had on your economy. It also actually drove innovation and styles. For in Japan, for example, the shonen, the townspeople who were, you know, forbidden to wear bright colors and so on, actually developed whole industries not to work around the sumptuary laws as such, but to create a more subtle style that still fit with the sumptuary laws. And this gave rise to a style called iki. So, for example, they couldn't wear bright colors, but they created linings that were bright and colorful. They weren't allowed to wear tie-dyed colors, so they created silk patterns that they wore. And this drove a whole sense of style that was much more subtle than the blatant color colorful styles of the samurai caste. So you can have like this very subtle rebellion against sumptuary laws where people make a different style that does not transgress on the sumptuary laws that in some way is kind of denigrates the sumptuary laws as being crass. It also drives a certain sneakiness. So, for example, a judge called Amerigo was hired in Florence to prosecute the sumptuary laws. But he ended up not being able to find that many people because if he spoke to a woman about having embroidery on her hat, she would unpin it and show that, no, in fact, it's just a wreath. Or if he questioned someone for having too many buttons or silver bells as buttons, then she'd say, well, they're not buttons. See, they're just little baubles and there's no buttonhole for them. So they're just beads. So people had very cunning ways around them. Of course, sumptuary laws could also protect your local industry. The English laws of 1337 prohibited all men and women, with the exception of the king, the queen, and their children, of course, from wearing cloth imported from outside of England, Ireland, Wales, or Scotland. So literally, they said these are the countries in that these are the countries that you can import cloth from and nobody else. And that, of course, is a very protectionistic attitude, but you're not directly putting a trade embargo on it. You're saying these are the sumptuary laws. So you can you also use sumptuary laws to protect your internal textile and tailoring industry. So sumptuary laws didn't just serve the hierarchy. They could also bring money into your government. They could be used to drive innovation within your textile industry. And they could also be used to protect your local textile and cloth making industry. If you like the conversation around how sumptuary laws and the economy work together, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about sumptuary laws and their societal impact. Many Christian priests supported sumptuary laws since they gave a certain modesty to people. Remember what I said about short clothes and men's thighs and, of course, women should wear, you know, little wimples and all of these kinds of things. And, of course, as sumptuary laws changed or as people bought licenses to, you know, decorate their hems or whatever it was, many of the priests bemoaned the decaying morals of society. Indeed, the same thing happened in China. So China's sumptuary laws under the Ming dynasty bear some special mention. In 1368, Zhu Yanzang ascended the throne of China, having kicked out the Mongol emperor. He forbade Mongol dress. He said no one is allowed to wear anything Mongol. And he also implemented this whole Neo-Confucian style of dress around the bureaucrats, what they could wear, the colors they could wear, and everything else. This had the effect of reducing the Mongol influence in China. It didn't eliminate it, obviously. A lot of people still dressed like in Mongol dress and so on, but it did reduce it. 
But it is interesting that because many people didn't obey the Ming laws, there were Ming scholars who then said, you know, it's the deterioration of our society because people aren't listening to the government and they don't respect the government's authority and so on. So it's interesting how much people in a kind of a scholarly or in a religious perspective attached to sumptuary laws and the modesty associated with it. So I would definitely, if I'm building deep sumptuary laws into a culture, think about who are the people who bemoan the fact that sumptuary laws are no longer what they once were and, you know, morality is decaying because of it. And again here, I must call out The Handmaid's Tale because it was done so superbly there to have that morality also enforced in the sumptuary laws, in the, you know, the red of the handmaids and, and so on, and that, you know, enforced modesty in dress. So it's really worth thinking about the morals that kind of can also drive your sumptuary laws. The other aspect that's interesting to consider is forcing cultural change. Now, I spoke about the Ming emperor and the forbidding of Mongol uh, dress. But Peter the Great also used sumptuary laws in this way. So Peter the Great moved his capital from Moscow to St. Petersburg because he wanted a closer relationship with Europe. And as part of that, he also implemented sumptuary laws to force people to dress as the Western courts dressed, all the way from the peasants, all the way from the nobility right down to the peasants. Now, he also had a chronic need of money, so he also used it to you know, levy fines and fill his coffers. So it was kind of a two-stroke there. He wanted the Western courtiers to feel comfortable and he got to fill his coffers. So sumptuary laws can be used by, by the religion to enforce morality, especially in a kind of theocracy type setup, or it can be used by a ruler who wants to force cultural change through forcing a dress change. And those are my thoughts on sumptuary laws and how you can use them in fantasy. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, you'll probably enjoy my video on the language of fantasy courts and how courtiers speak to each other. And if you want to connect around this or other topics, then I do have a Discord server. And otherwise, I will see you soon for another episode of Just in Time World.